So it seems to be one of the most common questions people think about, property or pension? I mean, am I just better off putting my money into property? It feels a lot more familiar and some people also do really well. Should I just forget the pension thing altogether and, you know, be like these guys? I think mine's just structured no money down with a potential two million pound profit. What about London today? An author and a property investor. Well, hold on there. There is another side. Yeah, yeah, it's so ancient, it's older than me. Phone call from one of the neighbours saying that um, he's changed the front door locks. I smell a rat straight away. So in this video, I'm going to be going over the general pros and cons. If I can achieve one thing, it will just be to hopefully make you think it is worth doing the figures very carefully. But before I start addressing this argument, can I just please say on behalf of financial advisors everywhere this. One is a tax wrapper, the other is an asset class. One is a tax wrapper, the other is an asset class. One is a tax wrapper, the other is an asset class. So yes, a pension is a tax wrapper. This simply means your money is in an account that wraps around your investments or savings to offer some protection from tax. As long as the money stays within these wrappers, once you withdraw from a pension, there is tax applied or potentially some tax-free cash. A property is an asset class, you know, a type of investment with its own properties. The reason why that is an important distinction is that you can hold property-related investments within a pension. For example, commercial property can be held within some types of pensions. You can also get property funds that you can hold within pensions with lots of different holdings. So it's definitely not accurate to say that you can't hold property in a pension. But for the purposes of this video, and it's because I know this is what most people mean, what we're addressing is the question of, should I be putting all my money into a buy to let property or into a pension? I am also going to draw the distinction here in this video, an individually held property and not part of a company or a family investment company, as this would just create way too many caveats for me to really be able to address and trust me, there are enough. I also have to say this is a complex area and a short video can only give you a snapshot. So as ever, make sure you do your own research and get advice specific to you. So let's go. So returns as safe as houses. So why do we have this debate? Isn't it just because property is a better investment? So let's first have a look at the long run data. In the Credit Suisse Global Yearbook Returns from 2018, they evaluated property from 1900 to 2018 and found it had an inflation adjusted return of 1.8%. In contrast, real annualized equity returns, so after inflation from 1900 to 2017, were 5.2%. So okay, so the return might not be as good as risky shares, but how about the risk? Well, the truth is property in general has been considered less risky than equities over the long run. But the expression safe as houses is definitely misleading. An example in the Dimpson, Marsh and Staunton data, they cite that in UK house price and recent history between 1989 and 1993 dropped more than 20% across the country and 30% in London. And in the global financial crisis, they dropped by about 13%. You might be thinking this data includes stuff so far in the past that it's not really an easy comparison to current circumstances. Well, close to now, let's take data from Schroders and they found that if you invested 100,000 pound 25 years ago, it'd be worth 451,000 in property and 727,000 in global equities up to 2020. But look at that north-south divide, it's massive. Anyway. Both housing prices in the blow and global equity returns are excluding costs. There are general maintenance investment costs that we're going to have to just call even for the purposes of this video and the massive assumptions we're making anyway. But wait a second, you might be thinking, no self-respecting property investor holds property for the capital appreciation. They do it for that and the income. So it also really depends on the rental yield and the after-tax income. And I agree, you know, let's chat about this later. So let's talk about a comparison as an investment. So this is where there is a stark difference. A pension can hold various asset classes that can be relatively easily purchased, held, switched or sold, usually without too much delay, as someone's situation may change or perhaps in response to an economic position. Buy to let property usually is just that, an investment into an undiversified, directly held single asset class, which means it usually requires to be sold if there's any changes to the portfolio, 
And that in reality is going to mean finding a purchaser who's prepared to pay the required price at the required time. So it's clearly a very different experience from buying and selling each. Now, the biggest one at managing these investments is diversification. And if you underestimate the need for that, have you ever watched Nightmare Tenants Slumlord Landlord? But I haven't, we'll get him out eventually. They can't stay there forever. But not to put a down on property, it can be great. It's just to say, it's an entity in itself and it's like any concentrated assets, there is risk. If you have a property and your tenants go AWOL, that's your problem. So an advantage or disadvantage here with property is that there's generally a degree of skill involved in property investing, especially when it comes to getting good deals, potentially making any changes to the property, etc. Someone who has the skill may be able to generate higher returns, but also then has to factor in the, the hassle premium of the time that you'll spend on it. So let's talk about funding the investment. Okay, or how you will contribute to each as an important difference here. Eligible individual contributions, lots of caveats, to a pension receive marginal rate tax relief for the investor. Although there are lots of contribution limits and lovely rules around annual allowance, money purchase allowance, tapered allowance, too many caveats. But if you do wanna hear anything more about that, put a comment in and maybe I'll do a video. But let's say you qualify for full rate tax relief and you're a higher rate taxpayer. To put a pound of investment into your pension, it'll cost you 60p because there's 40% tax relief compared to taking the money out and investing in a buy to let property because you're not gonna receive tax relief on that initial investment. There are also other planning considerations for pensions as pension contributions can potentially be used to manage child benefit, personal allowance tax traps, and management of these traps can't really be done with individually held buy to lets. So let's kind of have a bit of an overview on cost comparisons. So for pensions, they're expected to be no initial cost of note unless you happen to be choosing a fund which has initial charges. Um, there will always be ongoing charges with investing, whatever you're invested in, however cheap, potentially advice charges if you're taking professional advice or if you're purchasing a commercial property via a pension, then you're gonna to have to pay stamp duty. But as a general summary, you're unlikely to pay any initial costs for most pension investments. Now there are more costs associated with buy to let, such as possible stamp duty land tax, also 3% stamp duty surcharge, as it's likely to be your second property, based on a 200,000 pound buy to let. Hello, this is the director. This bit takes ages. You get it, there's, there's more costs. And let's have a bit of an overview on taxation as well. So in a pension, investments are free of capital gains and income tax within the pension wrapper. The tax is applied when an individual withdraws taxable income. And I'm being quite picky on my words as there is a possibility of tax free cash. Pensions which have discretionary powers are generally outside of your estate for inheritance tax. So it's always worthwhile checking your pension and see if that is set up in that way. So to compare for property, capital gains tax is generally payable on buy to let properties at a higher rate of 8% in addition to standard rates. So currently 18% for a basic rate above your exemption or 28% for a higher rate taxpayer. That's a potential big tax bill at the other end. And then there's mortgage interest and section 24. So just to overview what section 24 is, if you don't know, Basically, before this was introduced, you could deduct mortgage interest from your income tax bill when renting a property. Now, you'll need to pay tax on all rental income you receive. You can then claim back mortgage interest costs, but only up to 20%, equivalent to a basic rate of income tax. And then inheritance tax, if you hold the property yourself, it's in your estate. With taxation, I should also say there's always the possibility for both property and pension for the rules to change. And because it could happen for them both, I'm just gonna assume this is a level playing field. So, so let's walk through an example, and I'm gonna go through a very broad example of the two to look at the two routes and just to chat it through. So let's say on route one is that you're a basic rate taxpayer and you've contributed 200,000 pounds into your defined contribution arrangement, and you've received basic rate tax relief. And remember how I said that the tax relief at the start makes a big difference? Well, because you put in 200,000, we're gonna assume there is an uplift of 20%, which there would be. So actually that would start at 250,000. So route two, we're just gonna assume you paid the tax and now you have 200,000 in savings, ignoring maybe more the complex areas around national insurance as this could just get too complicated. So in route two, you wander down the high street and you see a lovely property and you think, yeah, that's great. Let's just, let's just rent that out. 
So the property's firstly gonna take a hit on the stamp duty. We'll also say solicitor's costs of about 1,200, and then general furnishing and white goods of 2,500 on the basis that you know even part furnished have to have some white goods generally. So you have budgeted that into your purchase, so this is what your purchase budget is now. And let's, let's deal with this income element first. So let's assume that you decide on a letting agent as because you just don't wanna to have to deal with advertising the property interviewing and vetting potential tenants, inspections, collecting rent, and the agent selects a charge of 10% of the gross rental income for the services they provide. I've taken this as the medium estimated figures from what I found from Direct Lime. Now, according to Seven Capital, the average rental yield in the UK is 3.63%, but I'm gonna be a bit more generous. I'm just gonna assume it's 5%. So that's 5% on initial costs, which is this. And remember the initial property price is lower because of the stamp duty charges and all the rest of it. So this is what it is after that 10% letting fees because they're a deductible expense. And that might not sound too shabby, does it? Well, then you've got to factor in the tax and we're gonna still assume you're a basic rate taxpayer. So that's this after in your pocket after you factor in basic rate tax. Remember, a lot of property investors are higher rate taxpayers as well because, you know, let's be honest, they tend to have more money. So that means the average rental income compared to the £250,000 on the pension would be this. But then let's think about the pension again. As a basic rate taxpayer, you would have had at least basic rate tax relief, let alone the employer match, which could have occurred and that could have even doubled what you put in if your employer was matching your pension contributions or maybe even benefit from salary sacrifice and national insurance benefits. But for this example, we're just gonna ignore that. So let's keep this simple and say you're a basic rate taxpayer, 25% you get as tax-free cash from the pension and you pay 20% on the remaining 75 pence in every pound. Or simply put, that's an effective tax rate of 15%. But now let's chat capital appreciation, as that's the big part, isn't it? So the big question we're at is, will the capital appreciation of the property be higher, or is the total return of the pension gonna be better? Now, we just don't know this, and there's no way to ever know. But let's go back to that Schroeder's example from over 25 years ago. The annualized return from equities was 8.26%. The annual return on UK property as a whole was 6.21%. But if we combine those assumptions, and we also assume that the past is gonna happen in the future, which definitely we can't. The property's annualized return with the income for this example was this, but with the equities, it was this. So maybe property's the clear winner in this example, or maybe all these assumptions are nonsense. So uh, yeah, it just goes on and on and on. Not so fast. Within this conclusion, you're also assuming all this not comparing capital gains, inheritance tax disadvantages, not factoring employer match, not factoring in void periods, not factoring in maintenance costs and how they would compare with your investment. So let's just bring this all together. And you know, what am I trying to say? As I started with, we know it's a false premise to compare property and pension. The purpose of this video is not to get you to think or agree with my assumptions. It's just to make the case to think. I truly believe the core of most people's wealth is either built in businesses or bricks, so you can build your wealth through either properties or pensions. Though my thoughts are is that we in the UK are a bit obsessed sometimes with property to the extent that we don't really run the figures well enough and it can sometimes feel a safe investment, but it's my job for my clients to consider all available options when undertaking financial planning. Good investment decisions are rarely done purely on sentiment. This has been Principles Personal Finance. I'll see you next time. I smell a rat straight away.